Well, when he invited me to talk to you and asked me to answer a question, why is a public health service worth fighting for? But before I answer that question, I want to make one thing clear. I'm not coming here to tell you how to run your health system because that's a matter for you. But the fact that you've invited me means I think that you agree that we can all learn from experiences elsewhere. And I'm sure you know that we in the United Kingdom certainly learned lessons from you. The 1938 Social Security Act was seen by many as an inspiration for the introduction of the NHS in the United Kingdom a decade later. Now, obviously, I'm at least in passing familiar with some of the dates that have been the debates that have been taking place here in recent years. New Zealand and the United Kingdom have contributed disproportionately to the international literature on health system reform. And I think this is largely to do to do with our political structures. We're two of a handful of countries, along with Israel and Saudi Arabia, that don't have a written constitution. And we have very few checks on the executive. And this means that our governments traditionally have been able to implement laws very quickly. Now, sometimes this is a good thing, gun control in both of our countries. More often it's not, because it provides too few opportunities for policies to be scrutinised before they're unleashed on an unsuspecting public. Now, in the United Kingdom, the results are all too clear. Whether it's dangerous dogs or NHS reforms, we have shown a remarkable ability to write laws that are unworkable or incomprehensible. And it's read one law, it led one law lord to describe what we do as binge lawmaking. Now, in recent years, the pace of change has slowed down in both of our countries. And here, at least as far as I understand it, a major factor has been the necessity of achieving agreement within political coalitions ever since the change to the voting system, a much more sensible voting system than we have um, when you did that in the 1990s. In the United Kingdom, the pace of legislation has slowed down for a different reason, and that has been the inability of the governing, uh, well, I use the word governing loosely here, but uh, the Conservative Party to agree anything, and I mean anything, among its own members of Parliament. And perhaps you will, have under, you will be aware, because I know many of you follow events, that the country is taking on all the characteristics of a failed state with the organs of government paralysed, and I mean paralysed, and the very prospect of a clone of Donald Trump taking over this ship of fools. Once upon a time, we sent politicians to you, and given our long-standing friendship, we would never wish any of our current lot on you. But I would say that if you do ever feel any need for a change, it really would be a great help for us if we could borrow your Prime Minister to help us get out of our current mess, because she is vastly an improvement on anything that we have. But anyway, I won't interfere in domestic politics here any further than that. The main reason I'm not going to tell uh, you how to run your health system is that you have got plenty of people here who are more, capable, more than capable of giving you that advice. And I was particularly impressed by a recent paper by Lyndon and his colleagues in the New Zealand Medical Journal, which reviews in detail recent trends in funding in the New Zealand health system. I'm sure you've all read it, but if you haven't, maybe I could summarize it. It shows that the widespread narrative that health expenditure is rising at an unsustainable rate is extremely misleading. And to quote an Australian economist who is cited in the paper, the unsustainability myth is probably a result of bad arithmetic. In fact, New Zealand spends well below the OECD average as a percentage of GDP on health. Now, as you know, one of the main drivers of your reforms in the 1990s was the perception that health spending was rising unsustainably, although, as was later discovered, this perception was based in an analysis that was at best disputed and at worst mistaken. The reforms that followed have largely been reversed, of course, just as is happening with similar reforms in England after 2012. Well, it seems to me that you would think that given our shared experience of failed market reforms, we both would have learnt something. Now, it is absolutely true that others have learnt from our mistakes, and in fact, in England now, it's great to be a sort of natural laboratory for everyone to look at as to how not to run a country. Uh, but um, in both cases, in both countries, there are still voices that are calling for more privatisation in the belief that if we try often enough, we will eventually get it right. A bit like communism, it just wasn't done properly. Well, what I want to try to do in this talk is to argue that it's not the execution of this ideology that is the problem, it's the ideology itself. Well, the question that Ian gave me simply referred to a public health service. Now, a service has got two elements, either of which can be public or private. 
uh, with almost infinite permutations uh, along the spectrum. So let's begin by talking about public funding. This is a subject about which more nonsense has probably been talked than any other aspect of health systems. And the argument goes something like this. Demand for healthcare is continually growing. Aging populations, increasing expectations, and advances in technology are placing ever greater pressure on healthcare budgets. The sums that are needed are far in excess of what can be provided by governments from taxation. So the logical conclusion is that people will have to take greater responsibility for their health care and pay a growing share out of their own pockets. Now, sometimes this is linked to the concept of the economic concept of moral hazard. And the argument is that if a service is free, demand will be infinite. I've always had a problem with this concept because as the slide shows, many eco economists apply it somewhat selectively, depending on those who are thought to exhibit this are rich or poor. It doesn't seem to be a problem for bankers, but it does seem to be a problem for homeless people. Now, I, I accept the, the idea that you know, there is a temptation to eat too much when faced with the sort of breakfast buffet that I experienced in hotels in Singapore and Manila on the way here. It cost me no more uh, to visit all of the different food counters, but even I rapidly got to the point where I'd had enough. And that's where the experience with the delicacies on offer is extremely pleasant. But even though I live in a country like you do, where healthcare, much healthcare is free, I've n I don't know about you, but I've never actually felt the need on a rainy Saturday afternoon to find a surgeon and ask them to remove my gallbladder or appendix because there's nothing else to do. I mean, it's free. Why don't I go and get it? But you know, maybe, I, maybe I just misunderstood. But there's another much more important problem, and that relates to the role of healthcare as a means of redistribution within society. So let's step back a bit. Even if we were to assume that expenditure on healthcare was growing rapidly, would it matter? After all, there are other things that we're spending much more on now than we used to. Now, I'm sure, like me, uh, you waken up every morning and you think to yourself, what is the government going to do? What is the minister going to do about the rapidly increasing amount of money spent here in New Zealand on smartphones? Think about it. 20 years ago, both of our countries spent virtually zero on smartphones. And nowadays, we're all spending many millions of pounds or dollars and if we were to plot this expenditure on a graph, it would be absolutely terrifying. So what are we going to do? We need to demand that government takes a grip on this and ask, what are we going to do about the escalating expenditure on smartphones? Now, of course, there's a problem because, you know, if we extrapolate forward, clearly within a few years, we'll be spending the entire national income on smartphones with no money left over for health or education or defence or even food. <laughs> the buffets will go. Uh, but despite all of this, despite the looming crisis, neither of our governments seem to be worrying in the least. When did any of them raise this as a problem? But of course, there's a reason for this, isn't there? And the reason is that healthcare is paid for collectively, whereas smartphones are paid for individually. And the reason that healthcare is paid for collectively is very simple. Those who need healthcare most are least able to pay for it. Those who can pay for it need it least. And if we don't have collective financing, then there are several consequences. And the first is that those who provide health care, whether they're health professionals like ourselves or the owners of hospital clinics, simply will not get paid. In the 1920s in the United States, American Blue Cross and Blue Shield were created by the American Medical Association and the, Mer the American Hospital Association. And it wasn't out of a sense of altruism. It was simply a means of ensuring that they would get paid. But the second consequence is that if people do not get treated, then they will either die or when our compassion eventually takes over and we do provide them with the treatment, it will be much more expensive and the outcomes will be much worse. And we can see this very clearly by looking at the one advanced industrialized country that does not provide universal coverage. In the United States, deaths from conditions that are treatable with timely and effective care are far higher than any other similar country. And they would be higher still if the United States government really did leave healthcare to the market. But of course, it doesn't. In fact, the US government pays about half of the total health bill. If you are a private health insurer, you have one simple goal. And this is to find everyone who is at risk of becoming ill and making sure they get absolutely nowhere near your policies. The last thing you want are sick people. In the United States, this has been achieved 
by intensive lobbying to make sure that the government puts older people, people who tend to be more likely to get ill, into Medicare and the poor into Medicaid. And that leaves you as a private insurer with a risk pool made predominantly of young affluent people whose risk of illness is much lower than those that you've got rid of. So in a country where many people reject the whole idea of government and see the government as oppressing them, it's only because the government has stepped in in this way that the private insurance market can work at all. So just to recap, when we look at a health system that we often think of as essentially private in the US, it really is nothing of the sort. All the difficult and expensive patients have been taken out to be looked after by government. And the outcomes in this hybrid system, including crucially the number of deaths that should be prevented, are far worse than in any other comparable country. But there is another problem. And that is that the United States spends a far higher proportion of its GDP than any other industrialized countries. And the reasons are fairly obvious. The transaction costs of collecting money from a myriad of different schemes and spending that money using different billing systems are enormous. And then, of course, for many of the insurers, there's the need to make a profit. After all, that is the primary goal of any private company, a goal that is typically enshrined in laws that assert the rights of shareholders. Shareholders would be very disappointed if companies were not trying to maximize profits. Now, I don't want to dwell on the United States too much. I hope that no one here is seriously uh, adopting the American system. Unfortunately, that is not the case in the United Kingdom. Many of the strongest supporters of Brexit, including Nigel Farage, are on record as expressing their support for private insurance system. Indeed, many of us suspect that the ability to introduce a system through a trade deal with the United States may be the primary motivation for leaving the EU. The one good thing, fortunately, is that many of these people, including many of our cabinet ministers, have demonstrated repeatedly their profound ignorance of international trade deals, so it seems unlikely that they'll ever get much beyond the limited post-Brexit deals that we have already negotiated, such as those with the Faroe Islands, or the Seychelles, or Madagascar. But at least I suppose it means we will be able to get fish after all, the supplies of medicine and the, the prof health professionals from the rest of the EU have dried up. But if the US health system is an extremely expensive way of killing people on a grand scale, why would anybody other than people like this want it? And here I want to digress a little bit because I want to go back to the origins of the European welfare state. And to cut a long story short, you, went to, you, you introduced it in 1938, but the other countries in Europe introduced the welfare state primarily in the post-war period. And the generation that built that European welfare state in the 1940s and the 1950s was the generation that had emerged from the Second World War. And they'd been scarred by the experience of a conflict. They knew that no matter how affluent they were, a chance decision of a military commander turning right or left at a crossroads could lead to devastation. They'd lived through a time when they never knew from one day to the next what the future would bring. Now, this is almost exactly the situation described by the philosopher John Rawls. And he, argues that a fair, he argued that a fair society was one in which those who made the decisions did so behind a veil of ignorance. They did not know where they as individuals would be once that veil was lifted. This is a thought experiment. They didn't necessarily want a society in which everyone was equal. The experience of communism for many of them was not exactly encouraging. But they did want a society in which they would be protected even if they ended up at the bottom of the pile. And this inevitably led to a transfer of resources from rich to poor, from healthy to ill, and from young to old. So in Europe, even those in the aristocracy knew that they could go to bed in their chateau or their castle or their schloss, surrounded by their estates and their servants, and waken up to find that everything had gone. The situation was very different in the United States because there, those with the advantages were white and they knew that when they woke up in the morning, they would never be black. And for them, that protection for the weakest was never necessary because they did not expect themselves ever to need it. And there's a wealth of evidence to support this argument. We know, for example, that the generosity of state welfare regimes is much less where the share of the population, a higher share of the population is black. The Affordable Care Act offered federal funding to states that wanted to expand Medicaid to benefit the poor. Some states took the money, some states did not. 
And unsurprisingly for many of us see, who see this racial explanation, those who did not, or many of them who did not, were the ones who had been in the Confederacy during the Civil War. And they were also the states that had experienced the greatest density of lynchings in the late 19th and 20th century. There is a wealth of additional evidence as well as the, beyond this. So if I can be blunt, rich white Americans are willing to accept a health system with a high level of private funding, even though it is extremely expensive and gets dreadful outcomes. And the simple reason is that they don't have to pay for people who look different from themselves. And I put it to you that this is hardly a good reason to copy them. <coughs> but now we have the other type of private involvement in healthcare, and this is private provision of care. And here the question is, does it really matter who provides the care? After all, as long as there's public funding so that the patient doesn't have to pay out of pocket, will they even know the ownership structure of the facility in which they're treated? Well, last year, Nina Modi and Jonathan Clark and myself looked at this issue in a paper in the BMJ, and what follows draws very heavily on what we wrote there. I'm going to ask you to indulge me for a few minutes because I think it may help if we reflect briefly again on some basic economic theory and markets. Put simply, for a market to work, a number of conditions need to be in place. And the problem is that when we look at healthcare, they aren't. Now, this was pointed out as long ago as 1963 by the Nobel laureate Kenneth Arrow. In a landmark paper, he presented a series of reasons for market failure in healthcare. Healthcare is not a simple product like a box of screws, but it's complex, subject to what we call information asymmetries. Essentially, the healthcare providers, you, for example, usually know much more about the patient and can convince them to do things which may be in their best interest or maybe not. And it opens up the possibility for exploitation on multiple levels with potential for adverse consequences, especially if we incentivize you to do it. Now, Ivan Illich, as you know, coined the term iatrogenesis, or doctor-created illness. Given that we all need to be reasonably clever to get into medical school, the potential for redefining what were once thought to be normal variations as illnesses requiring our expert skills is almost infinite. And no matter how perfect you are, there is always, I'm sorry to say to all of us, there is always room for improvement. And indeed, there is a international classification of non-diseases that have been discovered and exploited. Even if it is rather tongue in cheek, and yeah, come to think about it, maybe we could even consider whether having your tongue in your cheek is entirely normal and maybe something we need to do something about for those of you who are oral surgeons. But even as we're finding new conditions to treat, we continue to have large amounts of unmet need. And this is work we did looking at the impact of the financial crisis in, in Europe. It's a great problem in many parts of Europe. Um, and, uh, but as Illich uh, noted, um, it is particularly great there is a, where there is a market in healthcare. And he described how doctors accumulated in locations where the weather was good and the patients were healthy. Similar sentiments were expressed by Julian Tudor Hart in his inverse care law. He said, the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need for it and the population served. But those words, of course, are well known, and what we often forget is what followed them, because he said his law operates more completely where medical care is most exposed to market forces, and less so where that exposure is reduced. So we can see that patients and the public are particularly vulnerable to offers of profitable health services promoted through a growing number of vehicles, whether this be in social media or product placement in movies. And these services may be unnecessary, they may be unhelpful, or they may be even harmful. Too often they raise anxieties that provoke more investigation and greater uh, expenditure. The Scottish GP Margaret McCartney has described a patient paradox in which she finds it increasingly difficult to get necessary NHS care for her patients, while simultaneously they're being bombarded with advertisements to purchase whole body scans, personal genome screening, and other unwarranted health checks. So the consequences of a marketized health system increase the vulnerabilities of both rich and poor. The rich experience over-investigation, unnecessary intervention, higher costs and dubious treatments, and the poor lack necessary care. 
Now, Arrow's work informed that of another Nobel laureate, Oliver Williamson, who drew attention to the transaction costs involved in purchasing services, especially where the product is difficult to define precisely, and there's scope for opportunistic behaviour, which, as we've seen, is exactly the case in healthcare. Some of my colleagues at the World Bank have, and WHO have developed these ideas, suggesting that where the product is simple and the process is clearly defined, the outcomes are easily measured, perhaps like elective surgery, there may be a case for purchasing privately. But their analysis fails to take into account the complex relationships between the different components of healthcare provision. So, for example, purchasing radiology or pathology services from a private provider, perhaps based in a different location, um, has uh, uh, even maybe one that is abroad, divorces the staff who are reporting the images or results from those who are delivering care. And this can place the patient at risk, as was seen in a case of col uh, colorectal surgery in Australia only the other day. Knowledge of the clinical context and discussion of, of the uh, results between the professionals involved is crucial to high quality interpretation of almost all diagnostic tests. And in one study, discussions between radiologists and referring cl clinicians was found to have changed the diagnosis and treatment in 50 to 60 percent of cases. A loss of these relationships also diminishes training opportunities. Well, some will argue that regardless of these pro problems, private services are more efficient. But that is simply not borne out by the evidence. And this systematic review of hospital performance in the European Union concluded that most evidence suggests that public hospitals are at least as efficient or more, than effic as more efficient than private hospitals. Now, another argument is that purchasing from private providers can reduce the strain on services provided publicly. But again, this is not borne out by the evidence. The major constraint, as we've heard from the minister in many health systems, is the number of trained staff. It takes time to train a medical specialist. Simply moving those that exist from the public to the private sector does nothing to solve this problem. And worse, it's often more expensive, not least because the private providers have to make a profit somehow. Chile and Brazil are countries that show how having a large private sector can leave the public health sector essentially denuded and chronically short of staff, with, uh, with the public sector progressively more limited in what it can provide. Now, the development of private alternatives has attracted particular interest where there are long waiting lists in the public sector and where the treatments are relatively straightforward. And we've seen that with the independent sector treatment centres in the United Kingdom. But what we do know is that those, those centres work by avoiding all the complex cases, chronic con con compli uh, conditions and complications, and not providing any training. It simply cherry picks the easy bits. And we also know that they've often written contracts, which mean that they get paid even if they don't do any work. Now, you will have gathered by now that I'm rather critical of private provision, and that's true. <laughs> But my position, I hope you will agree, is based on evidence rather than ideology, and I should declare an interest because for 10 years I was a member of the medical advisory panel of Bupa, the largest British private health insurer. So I don't have an ideological problem with private care. <coughs> and there are clearly areas that it can work. I want to con I, I do concede that, but the critical issue for me here is, that the issue the, is the relative size, power, and influence of the providers. Because far too often I think we conflate all of the different providers, whether they're small social enterprises and charities, are global corporations. So, for example, supporters of American mega corporations taking over large parts of the English NHS argue that some types of care have always been provided privately, such as hospices by Marie Curie, for example. And they say, well, you know, we as the whatever corporation of America are no different from Marie Curie. Well, actually they are. They're entirely different. The small ones, many of which are charities, tend to occupy specialist niches for universal benefit. The large corporations possess tremendous power and a dominant position in a system that allows them to set the rules in their favour. The independent sector treatment centres were able to get the law in such a way that they didn't have to publish any of their contracts, so we didn't know what was actually happening. And now that we do have private mega corporations such as Virgin operating in the NHS, we've experienced something else because they have deep pockets and do not hesitate to threaten legal action if they feel that the contracting process has dealt with them unfairly. Even if they never get to court, this has a chilling effect on NHS purchasers. But what about quality of care? 
A recent overview of systematic reviews concluded that in general outcomes are worse for private for-profit hospitals compared for not, with not-for-profit and public hospitals. In the UK, some independent sector treatment centres uh, have achieved better outcomes than NHS facilities, but the differences are marginal. But they also had healthier and more affluent patients with fewer complications, and they didn't do the training and so on. Well, I hope I have persuaded you that when we look at the evidence in the round, the case for public funding and provision of healthcare is decidedly weak. Now, it doesn't mean that the private sector should be excluded altogether. There are some areas, such as the hospice movement, where it has made an important contribution. But it seems to me that, in general, these are exceptions. A market in healthcare, as far as I see it, creates the likelihood of inequality and exploitation, with suboptimal care for rich and poor. Complex, fragmented networks of providers impede attempts to monitor quality, impede delivery of high-quality patient outcomes and other measures of effectiveness. There's often progressive destabilisation of the public sector as private providers offer higher pay and cream off patients um, with um, fewer complications and have easier caseloads but contribute little to training. Cost efficiency is compromised by the increase in transactional costs and public monies are diverted into profit. The public sector is always there to bail things out when they go wrong. But although there is so little evidence as I see it for a much greater role for private providers, there's still considerable pressure to encourage it. Now, when I and my colleagues wrote our BMJ paper, we identified three possible explanations. Lack of awareness or understanding of the empirical evidence, possible. Self-interest or ideological belief. But often we find all three come together. We do know that it's not enough to provide the evidence. One of the talks that I gave in Singapore and Manila on the way here um, is about cognitive biases. We know that giving people evidence is not enough to change their behavior or change their thinking. And to quote Upton Sinclair and various other people, it's very difficult to get a man, of course, because it was written in 1934, to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. And this is a theme that others have picked up too. But perhaps the greatest threat is from the powerful vested interests often operating in the shadows, the think tanks that are, have hidden their funding. We have no idea who's paying for them, but we, when we do find it out, we see they're advancing the interests of their paymasters. And that's where the greatest pressure is coming from in the United Kingdom. And of course, as uh, some of us have written about, again, learning from you, it's something that you have some experience of here in New Zealand. Um, Catherine Rich didn't really like what I wrote about her in the BMJ, but I mean, that's another story. And um, so you're, you're all familiar with this. None of these considerations are good reasons for pursuing a policy of privatisation. I hope you'll agree this is why we collectively in both of our countries should be fighting for a public health service. Now, I'm sure that has stimulated some controversy, some questions, so at that point, I'd better stop and let you tell me what you think and why I've got it wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. I'm concerned you haven't told us what you really think, but we'll, um, now I'm going to invite um, three um, people to join our panel discussion. So uh, if Curtis Walker could join us, Chair of the Medical Council of New Zealand and Mid-Central DHB Renal Physician, um, Katie Benn, uh, ASCMS <coughs> National Exec and Nelson DHB Anaesthetist, and Bridget Connor. Uh, former ASMS Auckland branch president, former RDA president and Auckland DHB radiologist. And we're going to invite our panellists to offer a few reflections on Martin's um, speech. And then um, we'll open for um, some questions from the floor. I don't have a list. Um, I wasn't given a list, so it's fair game out there. Um, and I think we've got some roving microphones. All right. Who'd like to go first? Oh, I'm sort of poised. Go for it, kid. Something's yeah. opening. I've just got to get something open. Yeah, I've got something open. Okay. Oh, look, Martin, thank you for that awesome coitero, um this morning. And I, it, it kind of crystallises, I think, a lot of the thoughts a lot of us have in the room about the uh, challenges, the false challenges and the nasty dichotomy that is often presented in favour of a privatised health system. And uh, just a little bit of brief story about myself. The reason that I left um, a career as a veterinarian um, which some of you may know, some of you may not, um, how many years ago, 
was I didn't want to participate in the small business world of private veterinary medicine and moving into the academic world of Massey University, I realised that wasn't quite for me as well. And so I retrained in human medicine in 2003 with the specific and direct um, goal, enjoyment of working in the public health system and contributing in that way. Um, it's the reason I signed up to be part of a collective voice of the RDA in my first year of a house, as a house surgeon and went on to be president of that for five years. Um, all of its members are employed in the public health system. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of dedication there um, in that, in that um, organisation. Um, it's the reason I went on to, I currently serve on the board of the Māori Medical Practitioners Association, uh, and it's also the reason I stood for election to Medical Council, is to work to and contribute to our public health system. The pros of our public health system are that it's universal, but it's also, there are significant inequities in access. After the, reforms of the, after the reforms of the 1990s, which were, um, I think, pushed back um, successfully by and large in this country, it provides a no-cost access to secondary and tertiary services and attempts to provide low-cost access to primary care. Um, however, it doesn't provide a no-barrier access to secondary and tertiary care, so that's a challenge for it. Um, and there, it doesn't provide a no-cost access or no-barrier access to primary care and such other services as dental related. We deal with all manner of the sick and the broken and those not served elsewhere by the inaccessible private sector, the cream off the top argument which is there. Uh, we're the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff but also the fence at the top of the cliff uh, through our public health initiatives. We don't get to choose you know, the cream that we take off the top in, in our sector and we serve the population 24-7. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. The people and the knowledge and goodwill that our people have in the health sector are the most valuable assets very highly skilled, highly trained, well regarded, competent and a safe workforce and are great advocates for our system but too often feel burnt out, overworked and underappreciated and I think we've heard some of those uh, themes this morning. There is significant unmet need, there is definitely unmet want and there's always the need and desire to do more and we're, our profession is always finding more ways to help and that's in an age where we can always do more than we can afford or maybe that our society chooses to afford. And how do we say, for example, balance the biologics versus the buildings? How do we balance, balance operations versus vaccinations? How do we cope with the inefficiencies, large and small? How do we be better at sharing the good ideas amongst our sector and not reinventing the wheel at least 20 different ways? How do we have more national cohesion between our systems? How do we promote equity of outcomes across all of our populations, which should be the central goal of our health system, and I believe the public system is by far the best way to achieve that. And uh, to paraphrase Winston, Churchill, Winston Churchill's quote of a quote, I think it was, the public health system is the worst form of healthcare delivery, except all the others that have been tried from time to time, and I think we've heard some of that today. So kia ora, those are my opening comments on that. Thank you, Curtis. Um, Katie? <laughs> Not quite sure how I follow that. Um, it's going to be worse when I get to <laughs> um, I stopped making notes when you started talking about Brexit because I got so cross that my pen started making holes at the paper. So a couple of things that um, really um, I picked up from that. Um, I'll start with a brief background. I'm an anaesthetist. I've been in Nelson for the last 10 years. Um, and I actually came to New Zealand to escape the NHS and the glaring inefficiencies and the glaring inequities of provision. I was fortunate enough to work in Swindon Hospital. I don't know if anyone else here has been there, but I got there just after they'd opened the brand new wing, which was too small for what they needed it to do. So they went to the private hospital, which was in the other wing, um, and you could see the very glaring differences between the public and the private provision and the operating lists which had both public and private patients on them it was the same specialists it was the same care it was the same theatre team the pay was markedly different and the rooms they went back to were markedly different the outcomes were markedly different even though it was the same people in the same hospital under this essentially same operating conditions um, I love the fact that we can learn from experiences elsewhere and I really hope that the New Zealand public system does not go down that public-private partnership that the <coughs> NHS tried. It does not work. Um, and as I say, I escaped the NHS, came to New Zealand, found this amazingly delivered, in my opinion, public health system. Um, 
Oh, oh, I wish David Clark was still here. Um, our health secretary, uh, Jeremy Hunt, who is now in the running for prime minister, um, co-authored a book on why the NHS should be privatised and the fact that healthcare should be delivered <laughs> under an insurance-based system. And I have to question the wisdom of somebody like that being health secretary, let alone prime minister, but then you look at Boris Johnson and I'm not sure actually. You've got dumb on one side and you've got dumber on the other. And if you look at the picture of the two of them together, they look just like the actors. Um, my final closing comment, I absolutely passionately agree that a public health system is worth fighting for. I think all the evidence backs that up. We're all evidence-based clinicians. Um, but I would say that we, as the senior medical workforce, are the backbone of our public health system. And if our public health system is work worth fighting for, then I think our senior medical workforce is worth fighting for as well. Thank you, Katie. Bridget. And I get to follow that. Lucky me. I should have taken that seat. And, I, and, and after doing this for as many years as I've been doing it, I should probably also have learned to take notes, but I didn't because I just wanted to um, sit and listen. Um, declaration of interest. I'm a radiologist and I am a partner in a private practice. Um, so I do work on uh, both sides of the field, as it were. Um, and uh, I think there are places where private medicine has a place uh, and a role to play. But um, like Curtis, I spent some time uh, with the RDA and one of the reasons I got involved with ASMS uh, when I became an SMO is that I absolutely believe that a public health force is, uh, public health system is worth fighting for. Uh, I've worked both in New Zealand and overseas and one of the things that terrifies me after working in the NHS is that we might go down that route. I think New Zealand has um, a really bad case of and I use the term small man syndrome loosely, not, not meaning to say men, small man syndrome, small person syndrome. And one of the things that I think um, to our detriment is that we don't appreciate that the size of our country means that we can be innovative, we can make change, we can move. And we get these kind of um, poor cousin situation where we look to things like the NHS or we look to the states and we go, well, little old us, what can we do? We should do what these countries have done. And we absolutely shouldn't. We should find our own solutions. We should make things work here for us and not fall into the pits that other bigger countries have fallen into and do things our way. Um, probably the only other comment that I have to make, which I didn't get to make when the minister was here and I feel quite strongly about, is that he talked a lot about um, things that the ministry are trying to put in place for Maori and Pacific Island people with respect to health in this country. I think what we have to remember is it's way bigger than that. Health doesn't work in isolation. And we've got a terrible situation of institutional racism across all parts of uh, our society, health, education, welfare, uh, justice. And if we don't look at that in its entirety and where that fits into the health system, we're not going to win. Uh, so look, I agree, a public health system is absolutely worth fighting for in this country and we do need to fight for it and we need to not fall into the pits that other countries have fallen into. Great, thank you. Martin, I might invite you to comment on any of the panel um, responses and perhaps while, um, so to give people time to get to a microphone. Well, it seems that there's a, a relative degree of consensus among us, actually, but then, you know, um, that's fine. But I'll maybe pick up on, on Bridget's point about the uh, inequalities, because uh, I've said to a number of people many years ago, um, Judith Healy from Australia National University and myself did a book on access to care. And we looked at uh, inequalities, but we, we looked at the first section was about inequalities by age and gender and disability and people in prisons and so on. The second bit was about migrant population and and the third was indigenous populations. And we looked at Maori, uh, Australian Aborigine, First Nation Canadians, Native Americans, and, and Roma. And the, in fact, the Maori situation was actually much better than all of the others. And we attributed this to the treaty, to the legal basis. Um, now, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I think what you've picked up is that there is a, an, the, the issue is much, much wider. Now, again, I'm not going to come and tell you what, you know, this is just my impression from looking at it. But it seems to me that the, the narrative that I think we're developing in the UK at the minute, and particularly in the Lancet Commission and the NHS, which I'm on, is the way in which health services pick up the pieces of failures in other policies. 
So essentially, when the, uh, we've got a problem with the austerity measures which have led to precariousness of income, employment, housing, and food security now, increasingly. And the NHS is having to pick up all the consequences of that. And we know, for example, a study in Wales where there was an intervention to improve, to renovate old people's homes, people's own homes, but just to fix them up a bit. And it was associated with a one-third reduction in hospital admissions. So that is hugely important. But then, of course, the other point to pick up, and the, what the gentleman from Dunedin, was it, or Christchurch, Christchurch earlier was saying about mental health, because what we are now doing in the health se service is we're dumping things onto other people, and in mental health, we're dumping it onto the criminal justice system. So we've got it all the wrong way around, and if we can sort of align that, because I, I, from what I've read, and what I've, you know, and, and again, you're the experts, not me, the issue with Maori health is, that you're picking up the pieces of failures in other policies. So I think you've got it right as far as my reading takes me, but you know, hey, what do I know about this? I only visit this country every few years, but I think that you've picked up a really important point. I feel a slight response is in order from the Tangata Whenua on that point. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm cautious that, what am I, yeah. Um, I think I said the other day, if Brexit is traumatic for England now, uh, Brentry yeah. for this part of the world, um, <laughs> known as colonisation, uh, caused significant and lasting effect on our health outcomes, for which um, I think a treaty does make a difference compared to our Australian cousins, mm -hmm. and uh, has stood us in a good stead and stands us in better stead as we move mm -hmm. ahead, but it still remains the biggest inequity uh, in, our, in our health system and in our society. Um, so yes, signs of positivity and making improvements, but um, you yeah, need to keep going. Oh, I'd also sort of say it is all relative, isn't it? And that also speaks to that point. The relativity argument. We've got the NHS begging not to be like America, and we've got us begging not to be like the NHS. Mm -hmm. So no, I think there's a degree of, yeah, let's hold on to what we've got in babies and bathwaters. And, and all that. can I just say that there are health systems in countries that don't speak English? And most of the people there actually do speak English and can explain them all to you. Because one of the problems, and this is where I, I you know, I was uh, with my very good friend Robin Osborne from the Commonwealth Fund only about three weeks ago. We were flying up from Washington to New York. And uh, so th th they've always brought together, you know, the ministers from, I used to always meet Annette King at the, those meetings in the old days, which was great. Uh, had wonderful conversations. And, um, but it was Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US and, and the UK. And it was as if Germany and France and the Netherlands Netherlands and uh, China and anywhere else didn't actually exist. So if you are going to learn, I think uh, you, should, you should definitely develop your own solutions, I agree, but I think there are lessons to be learned. But don't just go, I mean, in the European Observatory, which uh, I partly run, uh, you know, we have information on all of these health systems. Just look at our website, find out what's going on and see what lessons you can take from there. I'd just like to okay. pick up on that. There was the most amazing viral Twitter thread, which I read and I've got saved because it just gives me something that I think we should all aspire to. So there was somebody who was resident, uh, an American who was resident in um, a Scandinavian country who, with, with work or whatever, and she found a lump in her breast. And she went to the local doctor and he said, oh, you'll need to go and get that checked out at the clinic. Um, here's the address. And she said, well, do I not need a referral? And the GP said, what's a referral? This is the address. You need to go there. You know, you've found a lump. Mm. So she kind of tentatively pitched up there the next day. No appointment, no referral letter. And said at the desk, oh, I, I found a lump. And they were like, oh, no, you need to be seen. And she's like, but I don't have a referral letter. And they too looked at her and said, what's a referral? Um, and so she sat in the waiting room with a book expecting to wait. And her name got called within a few minutes. And they examined her. And they said, oh, no, no, that needs an ultrasound and a mammogram. And she sat still, expecting to be given a, an appointment card. And they looked at her confusedly and said, well, the equipment's across the hall. You're going to have to get up and follow me. <laughs> and so she got up, and she went across the hall, and they did the mammogram, and they did the ultrasound. And oh, no, that needs actually looking at. Um, and so she thought, again, I'll get an appointment card. And no, somebody else came in and did an ultrasound and a biopsy. She got her whole, and every time she expressed surprise that it was being dealt with then and there. And they were like, but you found a lump, you know? This needs sorting out. This needs investigating. Why do you want to wait? Mm. Um, and I think we can all aspire to a health system that is that well organised and that well integrated, mm. where you get treated as, as the centre and the focus of the care. Mm. And it's not an endless stream of, we'll see you in three months, here's an appointment card, we'll give you an operation within the next four months if you're lucky. Mm. No waiting. OK, we've got three questions. One over here, two, and then three. Oh, sorry. 
Okay, we'll follow the mic. I think you, um, you're preaching to the converted when it comes to a public health system in this room um, because a lot of people are invested in an ASMS principally because we work within the public health sector and so we're very motivated to see it continue and thrive. But where we're at is that we've got a, a restricted funding situation and the majority of our DHBs are in debt for the care that's been necessary that they've provided. But the reality of working in an indebted DHB is, is really that you spend your clinical time just trying to prioritise beds and move patients around and your non-clinical time trying to justify why your service is important enough to continue to get the same amount of money it did last year in a shrinking pool. Um, do you have any advice as to how we can manage to work through this before those attempts to address those primary determinants of health through a wellbeing budget actually deliver reduction in need for care? Shall I? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Now that I'm an outside perspective, it would be good. You know, as the foreigner here, I don't want to actually monopolise this, so I'm very happy if my, my New Zealand colleagues want to answer. Yeah, I mean, this was sort of what I was talking about at the ministry the, the other day. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the, observ in the European Observatory um, on this concept of a virtuous circle between health systems, health and economic growth linked into societal well-being and in fact just next week I'll, we did um, a whole series of posters very simple posters actually which some of you i think have seen uh, uh, linked to qr codes and more detailed briefings for the g20 meeting in japan shinzo abe has sort of taken that up and we've got in fact 27 countries up there not new zealand but australia and, and others and the, the argument is getting traction in a number of countries because um, they're seeing that first of all investing in health services is you can show that it does uh, reduce, it, it can prevent the onset of you know, complicated illnesses. And you see this particularly in the United States with the very high levels of ambulatory uh, care sensitive conditions. Um, if you're a diabetic in the United States, you are vastly more, about three times more likely to have a lower leg amputation than in, in the UK, uh, skin infections, all of the things that, that really should not happen. And you're ending up paying for that. But then there's also the argument investing in health to increase um, economic productivity, labor force retention, and, and all the rest of it. And I think those arguments are being made. The other argument I should say, not an issue in New Zealand, that is gaining traction in Europe at the minute, is the way in which people are recognizing that areas that have got poor health are the areas where people are turning to populist politicians. My colleague Jacob Boer's work shows that uh, the decline in life expectancy was the strongest predictor of voting for Trump. Mm. We've got a paper which we're just finalizing showing the same for Brexit. It's not that the health is causing people to, to um, vote for populists, it's the conditions that, that lead to both. So I think those arguments are getting traction. And you know, I did have a discussion with the minister yesterday. I think we're seeing more and more that you know, it's challenging because it's not health ministries who've got to, who can deliver, they've got to get the treasury uh, to come up with the goods and all of this. And if you made a political commitment to limit your spending for a couple of years, you've clearly got a challenge. Uh, and you know, the UK went through that before. But I think the, the argument is being made and it is being picked up more and more, and I think we have the evidence. Uh, now, we were talking about it yesterday, um, and of course, uh, allowing people to, you know, helping people to live longer, it does have implications for social care spending and so on. I get all of that, but I think that the arguments for investing in health systems for better health and for preventing illness in the future and so on is increasingly present there, and I think politicians are buying into it. Okay. Thanks very much. I'm Jeff Shaw from Christchurch. I'm an intensive care specialist. Um, I think we, we are preaching to the converted. Um, there's not one person in this room that believes that the public health system is not worth fighting, fighting for. The conflict I feel is I'm not sure um, that, that I like what I'm fighting for. I'm not sure that I like working in the public sector. I'm not sure, well I am absolutely sure, that I could be having a much happier time and feel a lot better about my job if there were some very simple things that happened. And this is, I believe this is the elephant in the room and we haven't yet discussed it. I believe that management have no idea of what we do, fundamentally. They don't understand us and probably their job depends on them not understanding us. And they don't listen. It is our job to educate them. And one of the ways we could do that 
is by having um, a form of performance indicator, quite different from, what, from the usual ones. The usual ones are analogous to a safety one thing, where things go wrong. Now, where things go wrong, do not inform us about how things go right. So we need performance indicators that actually look at actually what makes us a successful health service. And then we've got to support those. And we've got to figure out what we actually are, are doing and what we're doing well and why we're doing it well, measure it as well as we can. And then on that basis, that's where the resources should be put into. I think that is a very simple solution to a lot of the stuff we've been talking about. And um, I did it, I've been responsible for a survey monkey of the SMOs in Canterbury. There's 620 of them serving a population of about nearly 600,000. 175 people have responded and the questions were, what do you want to talk about it at our engagement day? And I dreamed up 21 different ideas. And <laughs> all of them that they want to hear about is all about stress. How do I deal with increasing demands and not enough resources? Do you know they do not want to hear about research, resilience and all that other stuff? And I tell you what, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That we, before we can even look at doing the things we should be doing to enhance our health service, we can't even look to do that until we actually have the stress in our lives reduced. And that is a fundamental problem and this is where we're going to get, become derailed because nothing has been done about that at the moment. And that is the, that is the iceberg that we're going to hit. That's what I have to say. Okay. I, yeah, look, again, I suspect there's going to be a significant element of preaching to the converted here and of nothing but agreement with what you say. Um, it, my observation is that so much of our stress and burnout comes where um, our, our principles that we uh, live by, practice by, were taught by, you must do this by, uh, run into the day-to-day -day compromises in the care that we, we feel ourselves forced to provide. Uh, rather than dealing with sort of resilience and all of those kind of things. I think that compromise of our principles is, is a fundamental thing. Um, when you start talking about how can we start turning our system around to favour positive performance, I, I, you, know, you get dangerous because you start talking about these things like values-based healthcare. Now, that came from the private US model, um, which relies on competition and you fund kind of the best services, which, you know, we, we fund successful outcomes. But I'm a firm believer that there are some principles of that system that can be well translated into the private care system so that we positively reward the things we want to reward, um, in, in, but within a non-competitive but cooperative model. Uh, so I suspect that that speaks to some of that there. I think we already do, uh, do quite a bit of that and need to do more of that. Can, I can think... I, oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, well, I mean, you raise a really important question. The, the reality is that many of you know exactly where the problems lie. Many, many years ago when I was a uh, registrar on nephrology, we had a clinic on a Friday afternoon that never finished before seven in the evening. And, we, and everybody turned up late for it. I mean, the doctors, we all turned up late because it was a fatalistic, what can you do about this? Now, at that stage, I knew nothing about operational research. I knew nothing about queuing theory. I knew nothing about all the things that I know now. But I rearranged it as the registrar, and it never finished after four. So you could do it. And subsequently, some, quite a few years later, I had a, a, a senior registrar uh, who was a breast surgeon doing her doctorate with me, and she did it on outpatient clinics because I'd always had this thing about outpatient clinics being so badly organised. And we came up with lots of really interesting ideas. But what we found was, in London, there were lots of initiatives going on, but when we talked to the... Um, clinicians who were doing it, they would say, well, here's what I'm doing, I've got something to work, but don't tell the managers, because they'll stop me doing it. And we, we need to get this dialogue right now. In the observatory, we've got a book just about to come out on hospitals. I've written quite a lot on hospitals. I've got this thing about, you know, I've said it before, I feel that there should be a special place in hell reserved for hospital architects because uh, <laughs> they uh, are so badly designed. And uh, we've worked with Arup and with other architects. We've done a lot of work to say, actually, just let's get everything to work together because you can do it. Uh, but what we've done in this new book was that I thought, for God's sake, let's get the clinicians to tell us what needs to happen. And I went out to all the European specialist associations and so on. I, I had a real difficulty with our steering committee, which is largely um, ministries of health across Europe, about 10 governments, as well as WHO and the European Commission. And they couldn't see the point of talking to clinicians because they'd tried it before and they'd never got very far. But I persuaded and I persisted. But I have to say, it was bloody difficult 
Because I went to the European whatever, you know, all the different associations and said, here is your opportunity. You know, we do have the ears of ministers. We talk to them on an ongoing basis. We are very heavily involved and connected. We do all the, I won't go through all the stuff that we do, but here is your really good opportunity. And it really was like extracting wisdom teeth. It was really problematic. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a physician myself, you know, but we've got to get that dialogue going. Because often there's a shared view that, you know, we, we can get things fixed. Now, the managers are often under major pressures themselves to do, to, you know, for the short term, as I might accept that. There are lots of problems in the system, but I actually think that, and I'm not trying to be glib about this, I'm not, I, I don't underestimate how difficult it is, but I think that it is possible to do much more than we often realise if we actually try and focus on how do you go about bringing about change? Because many of you know what the solutions are. You just need to actually make a difference. But, you know, here, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I'm just, that's what I tell people in the UK. I just, I'd like to pick up on something, Jeff. Um, I agree with you that I suspect my managers um, don't know what I do. They don't know what I do when I get called in at three in the morning to help somebody on label. They don't know what I do when I'm sitting in the tea room, um, you know, waiting for my next patient to come to theatre who's not been sent for for a variety of reasons. Um, but by that same token, I don't know what they do either. I know they have... KPIs, I don't know what they are. I know we have SPs, which I still don't know what that stands for, but it means that we need to do some elective work somewhere along the line. I know that we've got, I've just had a, a message from um, one of my colleagues, we've got a board with about 10 acute cases on it at the moment that can't be done because we're still trying to do the electives to get these SPs and get our funding. You know, I'm really taken by the concept that it's a fight for our public health system. It's a fight to get our department equipment to get doctors. We shouldn't be fighting. We should be, my managers should know what I do. I should know what they do. It should be a collaborative partnership between clinicians and management to say, I've got this idea. Why don't we try running things this way and see if it helps? I can get ideas from them. They can get ideas from me. It should be a collaborative partnership between me and the management. It shouldn't be an us versus them. Um, it shouldn't be a this department versus that department for whatever crumbs of the pie we are currently packing over like sparrows. But I do feel that we are encouraged in that kind of relationship between departments, between clinicians, between clinicians and management, probably even between the managers themselves. Mm. Um, and it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. We should focus much more on communication and collaboration. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> so, oh, hi, if thanks. you just introduce yourself as well, so everyone, and particularly Martin. Sure. My name's Murray Cox. I'm a vascular surgeon. I work in Taranaki. I'm, in fact, a, a sole practicing vascular surgeon. I'm sort of, well, I'm the only one. I do a sort of essentially catch me if you can call, which is essentially one and one, but I love the job, feel it's a great privilege to do it. Um, I just want to talk about what is the appropriate level of governance of doctors. Um, I see Silva over, Sylvia over here. Um, uh, when I was director of trauma at Middlemore, I just, we found out that it took an hour to get a really, really, really sick patient who needs to go straight to theatre, up to the operating theatre, it took one hour. A ruptured aneurysm took one hour to physically get them from the operate, uh, from ED up to the operating theatre. We all sat around, had a few ideas about it, thought we'll put this thing on, um, a red blanket on. This is following a Brisbane initiative. Put a red blanket on and hopefully we'll have this phone system, no resources required, no resources required. And we did it, and it took three years to get that organised. The barrier, when we went right down to it, and I'm paraphrasing and gilding the lily a little bit, the problem, it took three years, the problem resided in four out of 65 anaesthetists. Now, I, I don't like to say negative things about people or anything like that, but there were people actively working against this project, which seemed pretty benign to me. And when we worked it out, there was a chance about one in every 10 years an anaesthetist would be called in, in the pro you know, called in, in the middle of the night when they didn't perhaps need, need to happen. And that would happen once every 10 years. So we couldn't progress this thing for three years. I'm sure you people died in the interim and it related to how we as a group, um, what our governance structures are over us as doctors. And I would like, I'd be very interested in Martin's thoughts about that 
and about how we govern ourselves. And if we govern ourselves, we have got to be, it is a, it's uh, the, one of the key factors of professionalism is that we have the opportunity to be self-regulators. How do we do that? What is the appropriate amount of outside influence? What is the appropriate um, way for us, what are the appropriate structures for us to check and make sure we all work together? God, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, and I do think, uh, I should I here declare an interest, I'm, I'm a member of the board of UCL Partners, which is the, one of the biggest academic health services uh, networks in, in, North East, in the UK, in England, Wales, in, in North East uh, London. And um, we do have, with the National Institute for Health Research and various other things, a whole series of funding opportunities to uh, initiate new ideas and to roll them out and to scale them up and so on. And at a board level, there really we actually do discuss. I mean, if there was something like that, we would be wanting to know what the problem was and how we can resolve it. And the board is a combination of clinician, it's medical director. I'm medical director at the London School as well as various other things, but uh, medical directors and chief executives, and and it actually works quite well. Um, but there is money to lubricate the system. There are opportunities, and I think governments can, that, that's something that could be looked at to see how do, you, um, how do you help to get that process to work. And the key performance indicators for our board are exactly the sort of things that you're talking about. Have we implemented change? Have we made an improvement? Have we got better patient outcomes? And so, for example, one of the key things in London was the introduction of a, a, a citywide stroke service, which led to a big improvement in stroke outcomes, you know, and now moving to thrombectomy and all the rest of it, really um, working out how to, to organise that and getting competing hospitals, rearranging cancer services, cardiovascular services um, on different, uh, you know, different uh, of the historic London Trust are now focusing on one or the other. So I don't have an answer as to how to do it, but I think that governments can create mechanisms that facilitate this process. We haven't got all the answers by any stretch of the imagination, um, but it is also a willingness to, to work together, and it's maybe more a willingness to work. The structures help, but they're not entirely... I haven't really answered your question, because I don't really, I don't really have a good answer, but I think, that, I think that there are many of us who recognise that this is something that needs to be done and are working very hard to try and do it. My, my glib you. answer for governance and the position of doctors or clinicians in governance is to get yourselves into the position of governance so that you can affect whatever change you need and therefore you need to be involved at whatever level of governance is required. Uh, so for something like that, it may have been, you know, you might be on the clinical board that sort of pushes those kinds of things through and uh, you know, surely there needs to be collaborative. Is there a way around uh, what are the issues for those few colleagues who, who aren't seeing what sounds like a pretty good low-cost clinical idea? But, yeah, so get into the positions of governance, wherever they may be, at whatever level they are, so that you can affect whatever change you think needs to be affected. Very glib answer, I know, but get yourself in there. And I do but, think it's difficult and it harks... <laughs> I think yeah, it harks back a little to what. To um, yep. Sorry, it harks back a little to what Jeff was talking about. You know, when levels of stress are high and people are feeling busy and burnt out, it's very hard then to take that extra step and put yourself in a position where you feel perhaps you're just going to end up butting your head against yeah. a brick wall. But uh, it does probably behove us all to try and get into those positions and, and affect change, difficult as it is. Yeah, when you're tired, question at the back. Yep. Let me put a question. Uh, it's Tony Sara from Asimov in Australia. The topic I wanted to ask Professor Martin McKee to comment on is public-private partnerships for inpatient and outpatient facilities. The background in Australia, of course, is we've had five. Port Macquarie had to be bought back by the government. Yeah. Modbury had to be bought back by the government. Wangaratta is performing extremely poorly and poorly and probably brought back by the government. I have made numerous public comments in the press about Northern Beaches, and Joondalup in Western Australia is unknown, but the colleagues in Western Australia say that it's not doing very well. So what does the world literature tell us about these public-private partnerships? Are they good for public health, public health services, or should we just forget them and, and stop the ideology and get on providing public hospitals? So, Professor McKay, your views, please. Well, read my papers. Um, so PFI, Private Finance Initiative, was described as by a former uh, editor of the British medical journalist, Perfidious Financial Idiocy. Um, 
And so there are lots of problems. Um, one of the biggest problems, I mean, first of all, you end up paying a huge amount in the long term. And in fact, we've used the example of the buyback in Australia, in, in Victoria, I think, um, to uh, as, uh, saying this can be done in some of the stuff that we've written. And I'm familiar with the stuff in, um, what's the name in, in Western Australia? The, oh, for, I've forgotten the name of the woman who's... The, hmm? Yeah, there's one of the there's one of the circle have been heavily involved in um, one of the hospitals in I think in Perth. Hmm? Yeah, Fiona Stanley, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so yeah, we've been following. Sorry if I. Uh, try and keeping up to date with about 100 countries that I work in. Um, it sometimes can be a bit difficult, but uh, that is one of the case studies that we have looked at. I mean, I mean, we've argued very strongly these things are really problematic, but the main issue is you build the things and then you can't change them because the models of care are evolving. And the analogy I use is that in a, way back in the 1980s when I was working in, you know, as a senior house officer in cardiology and I admitted somebody with a myocardial infarction to a hospital bed, I needed two electrical sockets, one for the bedside light and one for the ECG machine. Um, now you need an entire battery of things and the management has changed beyond all recognition with PCIs and everything else. Now, um, what do you do if you build a hospital that doesn't have enough electrical sockets and then you find that you're being charged $10,000 to put in a new electrical socket? Um, because, and we've, we, we've described this in a great detail and it's not just in the health sector. Um, it's the design, build and operator, the DBO mechanism for doing it. Um, there are lots of examples even in the private sector like the Eurostar term in London and so on and so forth um, and we've worked carefully closely with architects who have been looking at these issues it's a huge problem and you know we think that they're frankly a disaster uh, but uh, yeah I've, I've written lots on it so you can you can read it all up I think, yeah. yeah Roger Wanless from the Deep South um, two, I just want to do two things really one is to make a comment and one is to ask a question so th that's the overview of what I'm about to waffle on about. Um, the first thing is to thank you for your talk. In particular, I think the one message I got, and I just wanted just to sort of crystallise it really, but it seemed to me that you, you were saying that um, public health systems um, need to be um, fought for, saved, whatever, and the reason for that is because they, the, pr the primary importance of them is to look after the weak. And I think we often forget that, so I just wanted to salute you for making that point, which hit home for me, but I think it's something that you know, that's in today's world where the, where the news is of two migrants sort of upturned in a river, I think it's a powerful thing to be reminded of. So thank you. My second question really sort of again sort of touches on the politics. Um, we have a world which is sort of dominated by fake news and um, uh, turning a nose, to, thumbing a nose to experts, um, to right, right, right wing radicalism, to me, people making seemingly um, unbelievable choices in the way they use their votes um, and, and institutions in general being sort of undermined. Um, do you think that in the medium term there could be an existential threat to public health systems in, throughout the world? I think it's more... I think it's more than that. I, I don't know, maybe some of you might have seen the piece we did in the BMJ a couple of weeks ago, um, which they, in the print edition, they illustrated with a, um, a, a little pink-haired troll, which I thought was very nice. Uh, and um, we've also, in the European Commission's expert panel on health, which I sit on, done a report on vaccination where we've looked at this, and I have a systematic review, under review at the minute, of fake news. So I think the threats are even wider than that, because many of the, one of the things we're seeing is that health is being weaponized to undermine democracy. And if you look at where the messages on vaccines are coming from, many of them are coming from the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russian. And that is being a, a very substantial amount. Now, some of their messaging is pro-vaccine, some of it is anti-vaccine, in exactly the same way that they support the Ku Klux Klan and Black Lives Matter. And it's about creating dissension. Others, of course, are people who are, um, a, a significant proportion is people who are profiting from clickbait. Uh, so those are people who are putting out stories that are anti-health, you know, confusing, particularly around vaccination, fluoridation, things like that. Um, infectious diseases, I mean, there's a wonderful study in West Nile virus um, on the stories that go out about it, a paper I, I could have talked about, but um, where people attribute it to everything from the federal government in the US trying to spy on people's backyards by flying over them or spraying them to 
make them infertile or because of the movement of the North Magnetic Pole. I mean, it's beyond belief. Um, but some of these, these stories are being spread because people make money if they click on the advertisements. And then it gets confused because there's a town called Veles in Macedonia that was heavily involved in putting out anti-Hillary Clinton um, messages during the presidential campaign. And these people in this very poor village were making about $400,000 a month from clickbait. But we now know that Russian GRU agents visited the village as well. So who knows what's going on? And then there are just the nutters. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that with a psychiatrist present, but you know what I mean. There are, there are people who are... People who've got personality disorders rather than mental illness. Um, and, and so, but I think the threat is actually more to, to democracy as such. And, and with that, of course, some of the... Uh, but uh, so you've got the Farages of this world that clearly do want to undermine the NHS. The paradox is, of course, that there are some dictators who are investing in health, like Duterte in the Philippines. Uh, and that's because it's, it's a bit like Mussolini getting the railways to run on time. Uh, that can be quite a populist measure as well. So it's a bit of a mixture. Uh, but in general, uh, I think there is a, clearly a threat. There's a threat to expertise. And when you get to a situation, I mean, you know, if you read my blogs on the BMJ on, on Brexit, we've got a situation where we have had an entire raft of candidates for leadership of the country that are talking complete and utter verifiable bullshit. I mean, it, utter nonsense on stilts. Uh, and, you know, and you think we are living in a post-reality world and many of us, and with Trump, you know, I mean, I ask you, I'm also on the Lancet Commission. I'm the only non-American on the Lancet Commission and the Trump administration. What do I do? I mean, why do I, what have I done to deserve all of this? But um, you, you've, you're, you, you all, people like me, actually, who believe in the Enlightenment, believe in evidence, believe that, you know, that the, the sun is at the center of the solar system, you know, believe all of these things, uh, and believe that Article 24 of GATT will not be the solution to Brexit because it won't be. You just sort of give up, really. Do have a look at my last one, which was about waiting for Godot and the analogy of, um, of that one, and uh, that, that picks up some of... You can sense my frustration. No, don't Here's give up, don't give question. up. The... Um, <laughs> You know, wherever there's billions, yes, there is an existential threat to um, public and social institutions, and part of that is because of the billions of dollars that is available there that people would quite like to become, get a slice of that pie, and in particular the cream and the little cherry on top of that pie. So I think those kinds of existential threats where there is a large amount of social investment and social money um, will, will and do exist. And whatever the, whatever the question was, if the answer was President Trump, that, that is a bad question. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Siobhan Cross. I'm a paediatric haematologist from Christchurch, and I have um, nothing to do with the private system at all with what I do. But in my sort of simplistic view, I do see a difference between privatising some or all of a public health system and having a public health system and an ancillary private health care system. And I have friends that work in that system because even though they're busy, they find their one day a week working in that system gives them a sense of control over their lives that they don't get within the public system. And so I just wanted sort of your comments on whether you see those things as different or not. Well, you know, it's true. It's absolutely true. Uh, they do have more control. But that's where we do need to go, you know, going back to what was being said, you know, we need to get more control, cl clinical control in the public sector. It can be done. You know, it's not impossible. And as you were saying, in the Scandinavian countries um, and in a social insurance system like in Germany, for example, you don't see uh, a lot of these problems. But, um, yeah, it, it, does require, it does require a bit more money. You know, you cannot get away with it. What's interesting is that across Europe, if, just spending a little bit more, it's not spending a massive amount more, but getting up to 10, 11% of GDP does seem to solve an awful lot of the problems. Now, I'm not being glib and thinking it's just money. It's not. It's much more than that. Um, but I, I just think that we need to work uh, collaboratively, as has been said, to try to fix up some of these things and actually take back, take back control, as they say, in the place I've just, you know, I'm going back to. Okay, you've got the mic. Oh, yeah. Um, Aaron, uh, one of the radiologists from Wellington. Uh, just a, a very um, simple request to start with. Is it possible to have your slides to take back to my institute through Ian, if possible? I don't see a problem. Um, second uh, is, for a very long time in, in our region, uh, we've had lots of reviews about how to sort radiology because it's key to almost everything else that happens around. It's not shortage of um, reviews. It's 
inability to put those things into action. Mm. And, and that is the disconnect between senior management, ministry, and people who are at the yeah. front line. So to facilitate this stuff, um, we have now got another review going currently. So my hope is that by taking your slides back, I can maybe try and instill some sense into people who have to make these decisions at the end. Um, yeah, um, I mean... It's a noble spirit of persistence. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so, the, so the thing about it is, the first review started as early as 2013, so we're six years down the line. So persistence has got a point at which you actually turn to the private system for a specialty like radiology and say, guys, come on and take over. Now, we know we fought to stop this from happening in Wellington, a very unique situation uh, compared with the rest of New Zealand. But we are at a point now where a decision has to be made. So have you come across situations where there are numerous reviews, but there is no action? Oh, yeah. And <laughs> how do you move from here? Yeah, and uh, you know, this has been going on since the time of the Roman Empire. So it's, um, and I, I wish that my slides had some sort of magic talismanic touch that uh, uh, they're, they're, you know, having the slides would somehow change the culture. I, I'm afraid I'm, I wouldn't be that optimistic. Uh, I mean, if it does, let me know because then I'll start charging large sums of money for them. Uh, uh, but. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wish. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm not unreal. I mean, I'm completely realistic about the challenges of all of this. All I would say is there are examples of where people have done things. And yeah, if you look at some of the stuff that we have written about chronic care models, actually, that's quite interesting because it is about local champions. Um, now, there are big issues about sustainability and what happens when people move on and so on. But in one of our books on management of chronic conditions, we do pick that up a bit. There are examples around, and I know about Canterbury, I know all the issues and you know, I'm conscious that there are controversies and so on, but um, it, there, there are examples around the world that you can look at. Okay, at same table. Hi, um, hello, thank you everyone for your discussion and perspectives. I'm currently a student in the United States I eventually went to practice as a Sorry physician. Sorry about the previous 60 minutes of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> we don't hold you responsible. I mean, a major majority of your compatriots didn't he actually vote for now. him. <laughs> he might not go back now. I just turned 18, so. <laughs> um, I came to New Zealand to learn about the public health care system and was wondering if the United States could, or could benefit from adopting some of the practices. However, I believe uh, there are some issues that are unique just to the United States. And... One of these is the fear of litigation, or like being sued. Yeah. And burnout and stress are also very prevalent in the states, and I believe on average throughout the year about uh, one physician will commit suicide every day, just on the averages itself, which is almost a like whole medical class. So uh, do you believe that there needs to be a change in the public perception of how physicians are viewed by the public, as well as um, an adoption of like the uh, public healthcare system? And I, I'm just asking this because I'd like to have a little bit of optimism when I go on to eventually <laughs> practice as a physician. So thank you. Yeah, um, let me just pick up on your point about litigation. I remember Academy Health in San Diego. It was actually the weekend that Reagan died or, you know, quite a few years ago. And there was somebody from New Zealand, I don't know who, I can't remember who it was now. In fact, it may have been somebody here who came to talk about no-fault compensation. And to the American audience, it was so far beyond their conceptualization or understanding that they just could not get it. I mean, the, the, whoever it was explained it very clearly, but the idea that you would have a no-fault compensation scheme without lawyers being involved everywhere, everywhere, you know, it was a bit like trying to discuss, um, you know, some peculiar function of, of high energy nuclear physics or something like that. It just was not getting through at all. And that is one of the problems that you have. Uh, in fact, I was at Academy Health in Washington about a month ago, and again, you have this issue that often it is quite difficult in the US to, to think in different ways. And yet there is huge, heter huge um, heterogeneity. You know, you've got um, a single payer in Massachusetts. Uh, you've got that in Hawaii. You've got um, a lot of things that are happening at state level. Um, which uh, are beginning to address some of these things. But fundamentally, it is about politics. I would suggest you might want to have a look at Alberto Alessina's work on, on that. Um, you know, there's a lot of variation. Because if you compare outcomes in the US with, say, Alabama or Mississippi or Missouri, 
which are absolutely dreadful with Minnesota. I mean, Minnesota is like Sweden. I mean, I know it's full of Swedes that have moved over there, but actually, <laughs> the, the, health, the health outcomes in Minnesota are as good as in Sweden in terms of measures of, of uh, avoidable mortality. Political culture makes a difference. In a paper that we did some years ago, we took this political scientist, Elazar's work, and applied it, and it, it do But yeah, th so I think, I think there is hope, but it's going to be at the state level. Uh, and and there, is a lot of, there are a lot of initiatives at state level, but I think fundamentally it's about politics. That's the challenge. At the back there, and then down here. Oh, sorry, you've got some serious other challenges in the US, of course, around women's right to choose <coughs> and all of those kind of issues oh, going yeah. on at the moment there too. Just want to acknowledge yeah. those kind of, you know, that crap that's going on. Yeah. And actually, do have a look at our paper in the Lancet on the impact of the, you know, that we, we got it out on the day of his inauguration where we looked at, we, we attempted to anticipate what would happen now, of course, clearly trying to predict what the president will do in 10 minutes time is impossible, um, but at least it was an attempt. And keep an eye because we are actually working, I'm doing the foreign policy, international trade and climate change bit of the commission, but we're, we're making progress on that. Maybe. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the notion of the fight to save a public health service. And um, I was a consultant in the UK for a few years in the early 2000s. And, I, and I, if any of you have, were working in the NHS at the time, you were probably more aware of it than I was. But if you haven't read uh, NHS SOS by Jackie Davis, who is, I think, a South London GP, I think, or a, a clinician of some sort, really it's gorgeous. a really interesting book because of the, the kind of nudge effect of what was going on. There was PFI initiatives brought in in the previous decade. There was choice. There was expectation. I mean, I think Katie's comment about a rapid response service is brilliant. But of course, by acknowledging that people have a right to that, when you have an underfunded system that cannot meet that expect expectation, um, <laughs> should we say, less than scrupulous politicians can say, but of course the private sector can then meet the need that the poor old NHS or public system here can't. And I'm just really raising the need to be perhaps sort of vigilant of nudging, of, of not a big battle of we're going to stop public funding tomorrow, but actually erosion, attrition over time. We're all look, dealing with our own well-being, we're dealing with our patients' well-being, whatever, but this stuff can be going on in the background and I think we do need to be vigilant for that, as well as everything else we do. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the insidious creep. Yeah. It's the, um, so I was working, sadly, in England in the early 2000s under the PFI initiatives, and you had the case where they were paid to provide 10,000 joint replacements over the course of a set period of time, only to discover that we didn't have 10,000 people needing hip replacements yeah. over that period of time, but you had to pay them for them anyway. And then when you found the 4,000 people that did need hip replacements, only 2,000 were actually okay to be done in the PFI hospital because of various medical comorbidities that meant that the rest of them had to be done in public. But then all this money had still gone into the PFI. And it, it was a very insidious creep of private partnerships and private enterprises taking a chunk of public funding to provide services for public patients that they ultimately couldn't deliver. And we do have to be really careful of that insidious creep. And couldn't and shouldn't. And, and the only other thing I remember in terms of, you know, being in the UK and privatisation coming in was when they um, privatised the railways. And that should just be held up as an example of yeah. why you should never let privatisation interfere with your public service delivery. Because Wait, prices, prices quadrupled overnight, the number of trains halved, and all of a sudden you got to one station and you were stuck there for 10 hours until your next train could take you to the next one. Uh, it was just an absolute disaster. So I think here, didn't we, we sold the railway for one dollar and then bought it back a few years later for three hundred million dollars? This was, this is this kind of thing? I think, um, let's, let's add airlines and banks to that as well. Oh, okay. I think one of the areas where there is a, a real insidious creep that I know about because it's in my area is radiology and outsourcing of after hours radiology. And, and only by dint of the fact that I've got a friend currently in Melbourne <coughs> doing teleradiology <coughs> whose name keeps popping up on reports that I'm reading from other hospitals around the country, have I discovered how absolutely rife that is across yeah, New Zealand, that after-hours radiology is being outsourced um, to New Zealand and Australian-trained radiologists, but not in the hospitals. And that's money that's going somewhere else. And, and I, I would like to take issue with one of the things that um, the Minister said, which is that there's not a silver bullet. Now, there's not a silver bullet, but we don't have to wait 14 years to get a specialist. We could perhaps get some of the ones back that have gone off to other places by actually paying them enough to getting them to work here. <coughs> Thank you.
Hi, I'm Jenny Walker. I'm a renal physician. I've been in Northland for over 20 years, um, and I now do half-time clinical and half-time as the associate CMO. So I've got um, first a comment and then a question. So my comment is, first of all, to support what Katie said about being a team. Um, we have five SMOs on our executive leadership team at Northland, which I think is unusual around the country. Um, it has, I'm told that our presence has significantly changed how our executive team works, um, but it's also significantly changed me and my perception of what my responsibilities are. So I think as SMOs, you know, everybody's clever, everybody knows how to manipulate and to do things, and we can either use those skills to make the team work better, or we can make it blow apart. And, um, and I think that there's a bit of both going on, um, and I think that's on us. Um, my, my question is around equity. Um, you know, so we talk about equity um, between people, you know, and, and you know, our funding is, is capitation-based, based on a census, which we, in our <coughs> cleverness, made internet-based this last time, um, you know, which really promotes um, equity in Northland. Um, but, and, and then we adjust it slightly for rurality and deprivation and age groups, etc. But do we truly know that that formula works? And I must say, I look at what some other DHBs can seem to afford to do, and I'm, you know, I chair our equipment committee, and I'm deciding, you know, we've got three, um, you know, sterilizers for, you know, instruments that are beyond you know, they're, they're past end of life, and I'm having to decide, will I only do one, because actually if I put the three in that need to happen, then there's so much other things that can't be done in, in the DHB. And I don't know if other DHBs are making equally hard decisions. You know, I don't know how we compare, and how do we, how do we know what's happening everywhere else? You know, how, why is it that our threshold for getting a hip replacement in Northland is much higher than our other centres? If, you, if you're a taxpayer and you're living in New Zealand, your access should be your access. So, so my question is, what's about the equity between DHBs? I think that's a really, really interesting topic, and it's the subject of probably a very difficult and very interesting research project. Um, there is inequity of access because everyone has different thresholds. I know my DHB, I often see patients who come through with their first referral having been declined because it doesn't meet CPAC threshold. And then another letter from the GP saying they can't walk, they can't work, please replace their hip. And then their threshold goes up and then they meet funding. Um, yes, there, there is this, do we pay for, like we've just had to replace all of our anaesthetic machines because all the ones we had didn't meet um, the college safety criteria. They could be inadvertently turned off which is kind of not what you want halfway through an operation. Um, but do you spend two million replacing an entire fleet of anaesthetic machines, or do you rolling replace them and then put some more money into stopping the last, you know, your next 20 people going <coughs> blind because you're not providing your macular degeneration injections? Mm. Or do you accept the fact that 20 people are going to go blind, but then maybe be able to treat six or seven kids with better diabetic control? Um, you know, or do we use, do, or do we extend one person's lifespan with one of those immensely difficult to pronounce drugs ending in MAP? Um, you know, I think every DHB. Sorry. MAP. I yeah. heard someone smartly say oh, MAP. Apparently they're MAPs. Are they MAPs? <laughs> yeah, they're MAPs. Oh, great. Um, or, or do we, you know, and um, every DHB is faced with this very, very, very difficult conundrum and. I don't know how it can be solved without more money in the system. There isn't more money. And then we are put in that situation of having to make choices that we know will positively affect one person's life and detri detrimentally affect 10 others. And that is a massive contribution to stress and burnout that I don't think is recognised. So I've been, you know, I trained in anaesthesia. I went through ED. I've seen horrific trauma. I've seen gunshots. I've been to roadside horrendous car crashes and they say that's you know that gives you burnout it doesn't i can deal with major multi-trauma i can deal with a massive blood transfusion i can deal with people bleeding out on the table because i'm i can cope with that i'm resilient enough i'm not resilient enough to know that a decision i make about one patient on one day might negatively affect 10 people the next week 
I was never trying to cope with that mm. aspect of, of, of the effect we have on people's lives. And I think that's a massive, massive contributor to stress and particularly to burnout, particularly to females, um, that is just not being acknowledged. So I would love to see the research project if anybody feels like taking it on. Thank you. I'm quite mindful we're, we're standing in between you and lunch, and I'd just like to invite Martin, if you... Um, prerogative of the chair. Um, one of the challenges, I think, in our health system is that um, our public and our community don't actually know what they get for the public, the dollar that goes into public health. And certainly in my time, we've expanded exponentially what we provide in healthcare, but we have absorbed a lot of that um, pressure and cost. And um, to the point, you know, over the last 20 years, we're screening more people for more conditions. And I suppose, what's your observation of, and to fight for our public health system, where there's a joint professional leadership and community story to tell here, this country um, um, reacted so strongly against the potential to expand our tax base a few months ago, which could have added without, before yeah. we even got to the opportunity of having a conversation about what a, a wider tax base could offer uh, public services. What's your observation of countries who have uh, or learnings um, of who have been able to take um, professional leadership but also communities with them and advocating and fighting for their public health system. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I suppose, and it's difficult because this is a small country and there's only so much you can do locally. One of the issues is the number of DHBs, I know. But, uh, you know, I look, uh, maybe in this I look to the Scandinavian countries where the counties play a very prominent role and where the county health authorities are elected and, um, you know, they, they do, to some extent, compete in terms of their what they offer in health and uh, it has become more of a the political imperative is to say actually vote for us and we will do more to invest in health and that seems to work but the difficulty is all of these things are highly context dependent and um, it depends how you raise your money it depends on you know the fiscal governance within the country and, and uh, I'm not sure I've got a very good answer to that one but I think it, it also does help to have political leadership and political leadership that's saying, look, actually, our health system is, you know, is doing a good job, but it could do better. And, and actually, the politicians to fight for it, because the problem we have in the UK, I think, in England, in England, um, is that uh, politicians are constantly knocking it and, um, and denigrating it and trying to sort of say that there's all lots of waste and so on and so forth. So I think that political leadership is hugely important. And, and you know, maybe you, you know you know better than I do, but maybe you've got that now for a while. Well, please join me in thanking our three panellists, in particular Professor Martin McKay for...